In this video, we'll be talking about an ideal fluid. As we go through in describing things like Bernoulli's equation and the continuity equation and so forth, we are making some assumptions. These are simplifying assumptions that are made in order to be able to handle fluids in general. However, the important point is, is that if these assumptions are invalid, then the things that we develop are not true. So we need to be a little careful about understanding when we apply Bernoulli's principles or the continuity equation, what type of conditions are being assumed. A real fluid is a complicated thing. There are interactions between the molecules of the fluid, and those depend on the nature of the forces that are involved, and we're not describing those. They depend upon how the fluid molecules are talking to the molecules of the container. We're not talking about how those are. So we've swept a lot of complexity underneath the rug. Things that could be happening. The fluid may be getting compressed and its density could be changing. It could be that the molecules themselves begin to vibrate internally or even they may be rotating around each other if they're a diatomic molecule and that's energy that's being used and that energy has to come from somewhere and it can come from the moving fluid thereby changing the energy of the moving fluid. There could be frictional forces. What we're going to find out is viscosity. And energy could be running down because of the motion of the fluid against other pieces of the fluid. All those sort of complexities can change our results. And so what we're going to do is describe a model, a model that works very well, much like the ideal gas model works very well for some things. It describes the major properties of a fluid, but it also can have limitations. For instance, Glass is a fluid. It is not a solid. It is actually flowing. And yet when you look at glass, it behaves very different than water. So if you change the properties of this model, the model may not give you correct results. So let's talk about this model. The ideal fluid. What are we going to assume about an ideal fluid? Well, there's a few properties that we're going to make the fluid have, and most fluids have at least largely these properties in order to make the calculation simpler. The first is we're going to assume steady flow or what is known as laminar flow. There are two standard breaks in the way an object flows that people who deal with fluids do. They either talk about steady flow which is called laminar flow or they talk about unsteady flow which they call turbulent flow. You may have heard turbulence in an airplane, and you can know how it jumps the plane up and down when you hit it. When this flow changes from one type to another, which can happen as the velocity of that fluid changes, it can dramatically change the property of the fluid, which in the case of an airplane changes the lift, which is what's causing it to jump up and down. So if we're going to talk about a fluid, let's say here's a pipe of a fluid. And in this pipe, we're going to talk about setting some place in this pipe, say right here. And we want to know the velocity of the fluid in this pipe. Then we mean that over time, we expect that velocity, at least for the time we're observing it, which may be a minute or two, we don't expect that velocity to be changing. Different molecules come through, but when they get to this point, we expect that velocity to have a specific direction and to have a specific value. It wouldn't make sense if you said, okay, so what's the value, the, the speed of the fluid right here? And you say 20 meters per second, 5 meters per second, 60 meters per second, 40 meters per second, 12 meters per second, 3 meters per second. If you're constantly changing the number, how could we ever talk about it really? We want to be able to say 12 meters per second, 12 meters per second, 12 meters per second, 12 meters per second. We don't want it changing much. If it does that, if it doesn't change over time, now that doesn't mean that tomorrow the river will be flowing exactly. I mean over the short time of measurement, the practical time for measuring this thing. Tomorrow, yes, there may be a rain and the Mississippi may run differently, but over a small period of time when we're measuring it, we don't see that velocity change. We call that steady flow. The term laminar occurs because when you have this type of flow, we find that you can break and see that the fluid moves kind of like small sheets. And laminar comes from this word sheet. So you can think of it as sheets of fluid sliding against other sheets of fluid. So here's a sheet, there's a sheet, another sheet, and so forth. Now if I think of the places between these thin sheets, 
as being like surfaces, like sliding bricks, you might think, well, there could be some friction here. And that's going to come back to be another question that we need to talk about. If we lose energy due to this motion, this gets to viscosity. Now, not everything obeys this. At low speeds, lots of things obey this. But as the thing speeds up, sometimes it'll change. And it'll leave this type of flow and become what's called turbulent flow. So you can have this thing kind of come in here where it's nice and everything's flowing, and then it just kind of becomes totally chaotic. This property, you can't even set at a single place and measure the velocity the same every time. This type of turbulent flow has very different properties. For instance, a golf ball travels at incredibly high speeds, and because of its size and speed, the flow of the air around it is turbulent. If you didn't have the dimples on a golf ball, it turns out the friction would be much greater on a smooth ball than on a dimple ball. You may not know that, but that's true. And you would not be able to hit a golf ball very far at all if it didn't have the dimples. Now, it does something else. It helps the spin and some other things. But its first and primary thing is to reduce the friction in this turbulent region. In baseball, on the other hand, we don't want the ball scuffed up. Now, I should say we don't want it if it wants to go in a nice pattern, but if you're the pitcher, maybe you want it to scuff it up because you want it to do weird stuff. That's because the baseball's flow, at least when it's thrown, is not in the turbulent region. Now, when it gets hit, it moves from one region to the other, and it turns out it's in a very chaotic region that we don't have good formulas for. There's a formula called the reynolds magnuson formula, which is known to be completely wrong. And so baseball is very complicated for that reason. Let's look at some other things about fluids. Incompressible fluid. What do we mean by that? We're going to assume the fluid is incompressible. I mean that throughout the fluid, everywhere, the density is assumed to be constant, and it's assumed to be the same throughout the fluid. So if the density was 1 gram per cubic centimeter at one point, later in the fluid it's still 1 gram per cubic centimeter. This is different than, for instance, gases sometimes, which can be compressed quite a bit. Most things, like blood even, can be considered to be an incompressible fluid. Those laminar sheets, are we going to lose energy? Is there friction in the problem in essence? We call this viscosity. We will assume that this is non-viscous flow, which means we are assuming no energy is lost due to the motion of the fluid. Viscosity is actually a measure of the fluid's resistance to motion. So for instance, glass is highly viscous. It doesn't flow very fast. Honey is highly viscous. It doesn't flow very fast. Different types of oil have different weighting, whether the 10W30 or 10W40. That's measuring their viscosity and how difficult it is to flow. Now, because oil does have this, when you pump oil, for instance, even non-refined oil from the Alaska pipeline, there is energy loss in the heating and the vibration and against the, the sides of the tub, of the container, the pipe, as the oil flows through. And this means that energy is lost, kinetic energy is lost, and the oil slows down. So if we want to keep the oil going, you've got to give it more energy. How we do that is by doing work on it, and that means we've got to raise the pressure. So as it loses energy, that's negative work, the pressure drops. This is sometimes called head loss in fluid dynamics and in oil, petroleum engineering. And we've got to get a pumping station to get that pressure back up. That is, we have to put energy back into the system. Another thing that we require, the fourth thing about this, is it cannot be rotating. We're not going to deal with whirlpools. So. We're not going to deal with the case where we have large amount of circulatory motion in this fluid. So maybe the fluid goes like this and then comes out and goes like this. Or it has a sink. It comes up underneath. We're not going to deal with that. This would be a rotational flow. So we're going to make ours irritational. We're going to talk about things going like this. Now, those are the four properties of an ideal fluid. Steady flow, incompressible flow, non-viscous flow, 
and irritational flow. If it has those four properties, it is said to be an ideal fluid. Now, in order to observe this graphically, one of the things we do is that we like to see pictures and we create what's called a streamline. A streamline is a graphical picture of the flow of a small particle of the fluid as it travels over time. That's what I've been drawing with my little pictures up there. Those are streamlines in essence. So if I was to put a piece of leaf or watch a bubble in a river or even put a piece of some dust particles in smoke, I could watch those particles as they traced out over time a path. So I put some smoke there and I might see the smoke go like this. Or if you've got a something squirting out like a water hose, you could or some liquid flowing out of a tub like in the video the other day, we could put some dye and you'll follow that dye at least for a long time, kind of follow these patterns. These patterns like this one right here is called a streamline. It is the pattern that the particle would move over time. So here it is at some time, later time here, later time there, so forth. The velocity is tangent to the streamline at any point. So right here, the velocity is this away. Right here, the velocity is this away. Right here, the velocity is this away. Tangent to the path. Now, because it's tangent to the path, you can never have streamlines that cross. Let me show you why that would be. Let's say that you put a particle in here and the particle went like this and you had another particle that went like this. Let's look at this spot right there. If your particle is there, it doesn't know which way it got to here. But it says, oops, didn't get the right pin color, sorry about that. It says that it could have this velocity, but it also says that it has this velocity. And it says it has those two velocities simultaneously. Can't have two different velocity at the same time. So that's a problem. So they can never cross. Streamlines can go together and they can wiggle, but they cannot cross. We're going to find that there are other of these typographical lines called field lines when we deal with electric fields and magnetic fields. And that we find electric field lines don't cross either. In that case, it's because they'd have two different types of acceleration at the same time. You can't have two different properties at the same time. Now notice that's assuming at the same time. If you have this turbulent flow, then you can't even talk about knowing where this thing is going to go because it's going to be changing constantly with time. So the, the field line, if you would, is doing this. It's not even got a consistent streamline. So this streamline approach is for steady state laminar flow. And we use it a lot in order to help us understand. Now, as a thing speeds up, it can switch from laminar to turbulent flow. Um, this can occur because you can have a constriction which changes the speed. This happens, for instance, if you have clotting the artery near the heart. And this reduction in the area causes the, the blood to speed up, which causes turbulent flow which bangs on the artery, creating sound waves in the cavity which can be picked up with a stethoscope. And that's how we hear a heart murmur. So hearing the heart murmurs from the sound of the waves which are related to the velocity. But the velocity is related to the area, and the area tells us it's been clogged. So that's how we use physics to actually solve a medical problem. Go and get yourself some streamlines. Create a small running stream of some sort, and look at some streamlines, either by using bubbles, placing some drops of dye, dropping in some styrofoam. It'll do you good. And I'll talk to you in a later video.